The body of Elizabeth Stride was found in Dutfield's yard off Berners Street by Louis Diemschutz at 1am on Sunday the 30th of September, 1888. Within a few hours, she had been removed to the mortuary, located in the churchyard of St George's in the East, a building which still stands, albeit it is now in a somewhat ruinous condition. At this point, her name was unknown, and she was being referred to simply as the Burner Street victim. However, by the afternoon of that Sunday, several people had come forward to identify her as Elizabeth Stride, commonly known as Long Liz, who had resided latterly at a common lodging house at 32 Flower and Dean Street in Spitalfields. When Michael Kidney, the man with whom she had cohabited for much of the previous three years, visited the mortuary and confirmed that the body was indeed that of his lover, it seemed that the victim's identity had been established beyond doubt. But, as it transpired, a positive identification was delayed for several weeks by the emergence of a mysterious lady by the name of Mary Malcolm, who swore that the deceased woman was in fact her sister, Elizabeth Watts. In addition to bringing a good deal of confusion to the case, Mary Malcolm also caused a sensation when she revealed that she had received what the East London Observer described as an occult warning of her sister's death. Mary Malcolm was the wife of a tailor by the name of Andrew Malcolm, and the couple lived in Eagle Street off Red Lion Square in the Holborn district of London. At 1.20 on the morning of the Burner Street murder, they were, she later stated, sleeping in their bed when there came a heavy fall on the bed. She heard three distinct kisses, which her husband also heard, and she then felt a pressure on her breast. Later that morning, on reading about the murder in Burner Street in a Sunday newspaper, she had a dreadful foreboding that the victim might well be her sister, Elizabeth Watts, and that what she had experienced as she lay in bed in the early hours of that morning had been her sibling's spirit coming to tell her of her fate. She therefore headed over to Whitechapel to tell the police of her suspicion that the Burner Street victim was her sister, Elizabeth Watts. The police took her to the mortuary to view the body, but since it was now late and she was shown it by gaslight, she couldn't be certain whether or not it was that of her sister. But on the Monday morning she returned and viewed the body in daylight, and this time she confirmed that the deceased woman was indeed her sister. She was certain of the fact, she said, because Elizabeth had a small black mark on her right leg and she had seen just such a mark on the victim's body. The mark had come from the bite of an adder when they were rolling in the grass playing as children. The adder had bitten her, Mary, on the hand first and had then bitten Elizabeth on the leg. The idea that the Burner Street victim's spirit had appeared at her sister's bedside more or less around the time that her murder had been taking place proved irresistible to some of the more sensationalist elements of the press, and Mary Malcolm's presentiment became a major story in quite a few newspapers. As the East London Advertiser put it, If anything were wanted to heighten the horrors of these tragedies, it was the introduction of the supernatural element. The article, having given details of Mary Malcolm's hearing the three kisses and having felt the pressure on her breast as she lay in bed, went on to opine that Now this was just about the time at which the sister was giving up her life under the hands of the awful being in Burner Street. It was more than probable that, Judas-like, he first betrayed his victim with a kiss, and the pressure on the breast is what would naturally occur as he knelt over to cut her throat. Here, then, we have a representation of what was happening to the murdered woman reproduced at the same time in the mind of her sister. The article concluded by informing its readers that There are numerous records of people contacting their loved ones telepathically at times of great stress, and this is what appears to have happened in this case. In fairness to the East London advertiser, it did also caution that the circumstances she had related might only have come into Mary Malcolm's mind after she had heard of her sister's death. The fact remains, however, that Mary Malcolm's story caused a sensation and had indeed introduced a supernatural element into the case. 
On Tuesday the 2nd of October, Mary Malcolm appeared as a witness at Elizabeth Stride's inquest, which was held at the St George's Vestry Hall, a building that still stands in Cable Street. She seemed, so the newspapers reported, deeply affected whilst giving evidence. However, she evidently wasn't that affected, as to say that she assassinated her sibling's character and reputation would be an understatement. She positively annihilated them. She began by confirming that she had identified the body in the mortuary as that of her sister, Elizabeth Watts. There is no doubt about that, the coroner, when Edwin Baxter asked her. None whatever, she replied. But you had some doubt about it at first, the coroner pressed. Yes, but I have no doubt now. When did you see her last, the coroner continued. Thursday last at the place where I work in Red Lion Street, was her reply. She came to me for a little assistance, which I have been in the habit of giving for about five years. She said she had no money to pay her lodging, and she appealed to me for some assistance. I said, Oh, Lizzie, my child, you are a curse to me. I gave her a shilling and a short jacket. She was with me for only a few moments. Asked if she knew where her sister had been living, Mrs. Malcolm replied that she did not, although it was somewhere in the East End, Commercial Road or Commercial Street, and she understood that she was living at common lodging houses. Quizzed as to whether she knew what her sister did for a living, Mrs. Malcolm assumed a grave demeanour and replied, I had my doubts. As to whether her sister was the worse for drink when she had last seen her, Mary replied that she was not, although she continued by revealing that her sister was sometimes the worse for drink, and adding tearfully that drink had been a failing with her. Asked if she had ever heard of her sister being called Long Liz, she replied, That was generally her nickname, I believe. She then went on to provide a summary of her sister's life. Elizabeth, when a young woman, had entered the family of Mr. Watts, wine and spirit merchant of Walcott Street in Bath, as a servant. Her employer's son, Edward, had become enamoured with her, and it wasn't long before the couple became intimate, which resulted in Elizabeth becoming pregnant. They married secretly, after which Edward had taken her home and introduced her as his wife. The family had accepted her, and she had a splendid house, as well as her own carriage. Elizabeth and Edward had two children together, a boy and a girl. The girl died, but the boy, as far as Mary Malcolm knew, was at boarding school, kept by Edward's aunt. However, Elizabeth was fond of drink, and in her cups one day she became intimate with the porter. Her husband, on catching them together, sent her to live with her mother in London. When she returned to her husband's home in Bath, she found that the house had been sold and Edward had been sent away to America by his father. The family discarded her, and in her poverty she took up with a policeman, by whom she had another child, which she gave birth to in Holloway Workhouse. Later, a tearful Mary Malcolm told the court, her errant sister would leave this child naked outside Mary's door, and she and her husband had to look after it until Elizabeth fetched it away. "'Is that child still alive?' Inspector Edmund Reed asked her. "'I believe it died in Bath,' was Mary Malcolm's reply. The coroner then asked her if her sister had ever told her of troubles she was in with any man. "'Oh, yes,' was Mrs. Malcolm's grave reply. "'She lived with a man who kept a coffee-house at Poplar.' "'Was his name Stride?' interjected Inspector Reed. "'No, I think it was Dent, but I can find out for certain by tomorrow," was Mary Malcolm's reply. In answer to another question as to whether the deceased had ever had a quarrel with the man who kept the coffee shop, or any other man that might have owed her a grudge, Mrs. Malcolm said, "'Well, yes, she had a fearful quarrel with the man who kept the coffee shop, but she was of such a kind disposition that I do not think he, he could owe her any grudge, as, poor dear, she bore him no malice. But the real fact was that there was a stabbing affair. He either stabbed her or attempted to stab her, and the police were after him. He was a shipbuilder by trade, so he took a ship to New Zealand. On the voyage out, the ship was wrecked off the island of St. Paul, and nearly all were lost. 
although her sister had caused her nothing but trouble. Mary Malcolm had gone out of her way, she said, to ensure that she was looked after. For the last two and a half years, she had met Elizabeth every Saturday at the corner of Chancery Lane, where she had dutifully handed over two shillings to enable her to pay for her lodgings. Mary had gone along to their usual meeting place at 4pm on the previous Saturday, but for the first time her sister hadn't shown up. The coroner advised Mrs Malcolm to go to the usual meeting place on Saturday next, as there was some doubt as to the deceased being her sister. By this time Michael Kidney had come forward to identify the victim as Elizabeth Stride, and both the coroner and the police were making it quite plain that they believed that Mary Malcolm was mistaken in her identification. It is important that you should be sure the deceased was your sister, the coroner told her. There are a lot of complications here, and although I don't want to stir up muddy water, we of course want to find out anyone who might have been the cause of her death. But Mary Malcolm stuck to her story, and insisted that there was no doubt in her mind that the deceased woman was her sister. Asked if she had any brother or sister who might be able to confirm her identification, Mary commented that she had another sister who lived at Folkestone, and a brother who lived near Bath, neither of whom had seen Elizabeth for years. "'The shame of it all would kill this other sister,' Mary told the court with trembling lip. "'Elizabeth has been a curse to several families.' Then, bursting into profuse tears, Mary Malcolm wailed to an open-jawed courtroom that she had stoically "'Kept this shame from everyone!' Poor Mary Malcolm! And poor Mrs. Elizabeth Stokes, wife of Joseph Stokes, a brickmaker's labourer of 5 Charles Street, Tottenham, who was reading about the Whitechapel murders in a Sunday newspaper on the 7th of October, when she came across a familiar name. "'Good gracious!' she exclaimed to her husband. "'There is something about me!' "'Oh, nonsense!' replied her husband. "'I say it is, because I married Watts, the wine merchant in Walcott Street, Bath.' In an interview which she gave to a reporter from the Central News Agency the following day, Elizabeth Stokes recalled how, The more I read Mary Malcolm's evidence, the more I knew it was my sister. My maiden name was Elizabeth Perrin, she continued. I have been married three times. My first husband was Mr. Watts, a wine merchant at Bath, to whom I was married at Bristol. My second husband's name was Sneller, whom I married at Deal. And my third and present husband's name is Stokes, to whom I was married in St. Andrew's Church, New Kent Road, on December the 15th, 1884. She went on to counter many of Mary Malcolm's claims. Mrs. Malcolm, who gave evidence at the inquest, is my sister, but I have not seen her for years, and I do not expect to see her until I attend the adjourned inquest on the 23rd. My sister has never, as she swore, given me any money. It is untrue that I saw her on the Thursday preceding the murder. I was out washing on that day at Mrs. Peterkin's laundry near White Hart Lane. I never used to meet her, as she said, in Red Lion Street to receive a shilling from her. I am not short of clothes, and I never lived in Commercial Road, nor kept a coffee-house at Poplar. I may take a little drink now and then, but my sister never saw me in drink. Having set the record straight, she revealed a personal history that really was quite moving. My two children by my first husband Watts were taken from me, and that preys on my mind at times. I never quarrelled with my first husband. I loved him too well, for he was my first lover. Watts's friends did not approve of our marriage on account of my being a poor girl. He was sent abroad and died in America, leaving me with the two children, a boy and a girl. Where they are now I do not know. Their father's friends took the children from me, and I was placed in a lunatic asylum near Salisbury. The relieving officer of Bath got me out, and I then went to live as a domestic servant at Walmer. There I made the acquaintance of Sneller, whom I afterwards married at Deal Church. He was engaged on a vessel in the Royal Navy, which was stranded on St. Paul's Island, and there he died. His half-pay was then stopped, and I was left destitute. Subsequently, I was put in the Peckham Lunatic Asylum under Dr. Stoker and Dr. Brown. I endeavoured to gain possession of my two children, whom I have never seen or heard of since they were taken from me. 
The lunacy commissioners afterwards pronounced me sane, and I was again discharged, perfectly destitute. Owing to my troubles, my memory is impaired. I married my present husband, Stokes, four years ago. According to the Central News report, which appeared in several newspapers on the 9th of October, her current husband, Mr Stokes, confirmed that his wife's statement tallied with what she had frequently told him. He said that they lived very happily together, and he certainly did not wish to see her dead. He was determined to have the matter cleared up, because with such a stain on his wife's character, no one would employ either of them. On Tuesday the 23rd of October, Mrs Stokes appeared at St George's Vestry to testify at the inquest into Elizabeth Stride's death. She tearfully denounced her sister's previous evidence, telling the court that her testimony was all false. A juror asked whether Mrs Malcolm could have referred to another sister. Inspector Reed replied that he thought not, because Mrs Malcolm had identified the deceased as a person with crippled feet, and Mrs Stokes had crippled feet. Mrs. Stokes then launched into an angry diatribe against her sister. She knows me well enough. Her evidence was infamy and lies, and I am sorry that I have a sister who can tell such dreadful falsehoods. She has put me, a poor woman, to terrible trial, and I want to know if she is to be allowed to take my character away in such a cruel manner. She said that I had been the curse of many families. At this point the coroner cut her short, telling her, I think that will do, Mrs. Stokes. "'Is Mrs. Malcolm present?' he asked, no doubt wanting her to explain the confusion that her earlier testimony had caused. "'No, sir,' was Inspector Reed's succinct reply. In his summing up, the coroner made reference to the trouble and delay that had resulted from Mary Malcolm's claims, but, he told the jury, it was now satisfactorily proved that the deceased was Elizabeth Stride. The jury was now able to return a verdict of willful murder against a person or persons unknown, and they added their belief that the deceased was Elizabeth Stride. Of course, this begs the question, what could have been Mary Malcolm's possible motivation for spinning such an elaborate yarn, and why did she stick to her story whilst under oath and against hostile questioning from the police and the coroner, both of whom made it quite plain that they believed that she was mistaken in her identification. There are several possibilities. One is that she was a ghoulish spectator who simply wanted to see the body of the victim. If that was the case, why didn't she simply walk away on the Sunday or the Monday once she had viewed the body? Why perjure herself under oath? Could she have been an attention seeker who was enjoying her time in the spotlight? Or was she hoping to benefit financially from her story, even if it meant defaming her sister and trashing her reputation? On Wednesday the 12th of December, 1888, the New Zealand newspaper Te Aroha News published a letter from a correspondent in London named Elise, whose husband, Tom, had, she wrote, been present during Mary Malcolm's inquest testimony. Tom attended that Berners Street inquest on business one day last week. He says you happy colonists can form only the vaguest idea of the sort of human beings the lowest strata of the East End are. The sister of the poor woman's stride was a gin-sodden virago, and identified her mutilated relative with ghoulish relish. From first to last, this woman's transparent object was to turn the catastrophe to account somehow. So obvious did the past become that the coroner doubted whether she was the deceased's sister. Others, too, were sceptical on the point, but the story she told, in the main, proved accurate. Not one word of honest pity for the dead woman's shocking fate crossed her lips. Her own goodness and generosity to her poor sister was the never-ending theme of her discourse, or would have been if the coroner had not cut her short. A final possible reason for her misleading testimony is that Mary Malcolm genuinely believed that Elizabeth Stride was Elizabeth Watts. The majority of the journalists covering her inquest appearance remarked on the fact that she seemed genuinely bereft by her sister's death, and it is worth noting that many of the facts that she revealed about her sibling's past life were corroborated by her sister's own account to the Central News Agency. Could Elizabeth Stride have been passing herself off as Elizabeth Watts to Mary Malcolm? 
Michael Kidney, when giving his evidence at the inquest into Elizabeth Stride's death, stated that Mary Malcolm very much resembled the deceased, so it is possible that Elizabeth Stokes or Watts did so too, a resemblance that Elizabeth Stride may have used to her advantage to elicit funds from Mary Malcolm. The truth is that today we can only speculate as to Mary Malcolm's reasons for identifying the Burner Street victim as her sister and for saying what she did about her. She is just one of the many aspects of the case that cropped up, added another twist or element of mystery, and then disappeared back into obscurity.